We ask if women leaders are fundamental to the transformation we're all seeking in food, agriculture, and everything in between. I'm very delighted to introduce you to these three incredible women. Thank you all for coming. Each are working hard to create a more sustainable, healthy, and just food system. On my left, we have Danielle Nirenberg. She's co-founder of Food Tank, a nonprofit organization focused on building a global community for safe, healthy, nourished eaters. And next, we have Kathleen Finlay, president of Glenwood and founder and board chair of the Pleiades Network, an organization dedicated to advancing women's leadership and creating a more sustainable world. And Navina Khanna, director of the Heal Food Alliance, a national multi-sector, multi-racial coalition of food and farm justice organizations. So I just want to start with a very general question for each of you. Can each of you tell us about your work with women in agriculture? Start. Sure. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. I want to thank Stone Barnes for inviting me and putting this panel together. So I, I'm the president of this organization called Food Tank. And we're a research and advocacy organization that really tries to highlight stories of hope and success in the food system, both internationally and domestically. And I've had this incredible opportunity to really travel the world and interview hundreds and hundreds of farmers and researchers and scientists and youth advocates and, and women's groups and, and the whole range of food system stakeholders and really try to bring their stories that are often untold to a wider audience of businesses, of, of policymakers, of eaters like everyone in this room, and of farmers. And, and so through that, you know, I've really come to understand that, that women are often this sort of invisible sisterhood in the food system and the food movement too. Um, because they're not recognized for the efforts that they're making towards food security, um, <clears throat> improving nutrient density, alleviating um, uh, poverty, and also preventing things like food loss and food waste. And, and, and so again, one of the things that Food Tank tries to do is, is tell those untold stories and really um, help find ways to make sure that women aren't thought of as victims, that they're, they're thought of as, as real stakeholders, that they're, the, the um, efforts that they're making are recognized. You know, we have a, a situation where at least 43% of the, the world's agricultural labor force are women, yet they don't always have access to land and credit and financial and banking services or education and extension services. So really shining a spotlight on all the efforts that women are making to, to improve some of our, our, our biggest social, environmental, and agricultural problems. Thank you. Kathleen. Yeah, hi, it's great to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, so my work around women's leadership and supporting women in, uh, in fostering leadership to address a host of issues started when I was working at Harvard, which was a pretty male-dominated working environment. And um, we were addressing issues of global environmental change, and I sought out other women who um, were working on those issues. And what we shared is that, what we realized is that the environmental movement, while the, it's uh, the task force, if you look at the environmental movement across the country, is um, is there's a lot of women working on those issues, but at the leadership level, in terms of the executive directors or board level, it's still, actually, this is, I started this network um, almost 10 years ago, and it hasn't, actually, the needle hasn't moved. It's about 75% of the major NGOs, environmental NGOs, are still run by men. Um, so what, what that experience of coming together in community with women who want to make a difference in a range of issues related to the environment was incredibly powerful and uh, helped f us figure out ways we can explicitly support each other in doing good work. And that, that, has, um, that is in me, that has uh, now in my role at Glenwood where we are addressing trying to build a regional food system, it, it is part of the approach that I personally take in my role as a leader in that movement. So um, 
uh, we are working to build, I'm like a, this like addicted network builder. So we're just really re working to build networks of women in ag to help inform each other, learn from each other, help really just resource each other to, um, to make these changes. So that's what I'll be talking about today. Davina? Cool, thanks. Um, thanks for having me here. I know it's been an eventful couple days and glad to be joining you all on the tail end. Um, so, so I think one of the things I want to start by naming is, I, I expressed this to folks on the panel, my, my slight discomfort with having a panel that's about women in agriculture. Um, and just to name explicitly how much learning I've had from folks who are um, gender fluid, two-spirit, trans, and um, I think that part of part of when we're like talking about the shift that we're trying to make, um, including through HEAL and I think through a lot of our organizations, it's really about dismantling patriarchy and systems of dominance um, and not about upholding a gender binary. Um, so I just want to make sure that we're clear about that. And these systems of dominance we know are, are harmful to all of us. We're really trying to move towards more regenerative systems. And, and that's a big part of HEAL's work and I think the work that we're seeing in, in many social justice movements right now. Um, one of the things about HEAL is that we are a multi-sector uh, coalition and we really try to work with folks um, working on a whole range of issues. And I think there's there's been a couple of really great examples recently of how people who are not benefiting from systems of domination have stepped up into leadership. And Kathleen's talking about building these networks, which are, which are so important, the sisterhood that is um, so important for us to really build those movements. So folks like Tarana Burke and um, Alicia Garza, Opal and Patrice, who have, have been at the forefront of uh, holding spaces for movements to grow and build. And at HEAL, we, um, we're, we're really trying to shift away from the model of, of top-down leadership towards more participatory and collaborative systems. I think that that, again, is about, you know, we'll, we'll hear more about this, but about what um, a more feminine or less patriarchal kind of leadership looks like. It's about building those kinds of systems. Um, in terms of our work, specifically a, a couple of the issues that are uh, ripe for us, not just thinking about the leadership, but thinking about how women are affected negatively by our industrial food system. I think a couple of the things that I'll just name are uh, thinking about the pay gap for women, especially women of color, um, and how women of color especially have very limited access to advancement in um, our institutions. Um, as well as thinking about uh, women who, when we talk about women in agriculture, thinking about women who work on farms, who are not farm owners, but are farm workers, um, who are doing much of the labor. And in addition to all of the kinds of abuses and wage theft and so on that most farm workers experience in this country, women, of course, are also subject to sexual harassment and sexual assault. Um, some of you may have seen the the open letter signed by about 700,000 farm worker women um, as part of the Me Too campaign recently. Uh, and that's an, that's an ongoing phenomenon. So uh, for us specifically, what I'll say is that we're, we're really trying to start from a place of uh, frontline leadership, and that means the folks that are most affected negatively by our current systems being in leadership of the decisions that we're making and how we uh, move our campaigns. Thank you. So yes, um, Navina, we were talking about like thinking about the transition from patriarchy and dominance to regenerative systems. And um, Kathleen, you touched a little bit about like women's networks and about working from the ground up. But are there any other? Is there any advice from any of you on how to help each other along the way, this path? I mean, I think there's a lot of wisdom in this room, so I just want to throw out that I'd love to hear when we do open it up for dialogue, um, what what you, what the the folks who identify as women in the room feel um, would be helpful for them, in in where they're at, and um, so I just throw that out there. I mean, I think that I, I, I kind of re underscore what I was saying earlier is this this importance of relationship building and um, really coming together and dialoguing 
around a, a host of issues, but um, really listening to each other and hearing each other's needs and then trying to resource them, um, those needs collectively. And, and farming, I think there was, there's sometimes a misconception that farming is um, very siloed and like this image of a lone farmer. And in my experience, farming, and especially the kind of farming that I hope we're all advocating for here, um, is entirely dependent upon those relationships. So um, every, uh, um, Every person working in agriculture that I come across is 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 really skilled relationship builder, um, and so those same those same qualities around these issues about how we can um, help increase representation and how we can help address some of the issues that hold us back that hold us back from real change and um, as Navina said, a, a partnership society or a non-dominant society. Um, so I'm just, that's what I would say. Sure, I, I think one of the things for all of us is is recognizing the ways that this these systems of domination of patriarchy have hurt all of us or are harmful to all of us. Some people, of course, are more beneficiaries of systems of male privilege, uh, but but it's it's harming all of us. We can see that in the kinds of extraction uh, and you know, climate chaos that's evolving and the mass developments um, from this way of thinking. And uh, it's it's hard to move away from that, right? It's hard when um, everything that we're taught from a young age and for generations going back mm -hmm. is about succeeding in these systems. And so I think part of what we can do and need to do is recognize recognize how challenging it is, first of all, right? That it's not just about policy changes or access to land or access to credit or things like that, but there's actually a lot of um, cultural and social things that we're up against as we're trying to make this shift um, and to take care of each other in that process, right? Recognize that all of us are gonna make mistakes along the way. I think um, you know, as we're trying to dismantle systems of patriarchy and male dominance, um, it's very similar to how we're talking about dismantling uh, white privilege and talking about dismantling racism. Um, and, and we can hold each other accountable in those processes, but also recognize that this is a collective healing um, that we need to undertake and that none of us actually know what the, the other side of that looks like entirely. We're, we're in this together, right? We're learning together. Um, there are a couple of examples of societies that have maintained matriarchal systems and nurturing systems and um, systems that are not about extraction and dominance. Um, a lot of indigenous cultures and a lot of indigenous wisdom for us to learn from. Um, but as a as a society, we're we're in a co-learning process, and um, there's a lot of just like nurturing and taking care of each other that we need to do to make these shifts. I, I would just echo both. Uh, you know what was said by both the panelists. I mean, I think what this sort of reiterates for me, I, you know, I attend a lot of conferences where we talk about women in agriculture and what women in agriculture need. And I think what's evident is that women and other underrepresented groups need equality in all aspects of their lives, not just agriculture, for this to really, you know, for, for women and other groups to really be, you know, have equal access to everything that they need to, you know, whether they're farmers to do their jobs better, whether they're business leaders, you know, to have their, the resources that they need. So I think, you know, it's about equality in all aspects of their lives, not just in, in food and agriculture. Thank you. So at the risk of generalizing here, um, there is a sort of a general feeling that, um, and some recent, actual recent studies have shown that women as a whole have more capacity for compassion and are more empathetic than men. What are the implications for changing our food system if more women were to farm and take up leadership roles in this industry? For example, do you think there could be a shift in animal welfare practices in factory farms, better treatment of food workers and farmers, and more emphasis on reducing pollution? Uh, I'll just start. I, I sort of don't like this um, <laughs> distinction between, you know, men is more sort of 
authoritative and, and women is more compassionate. I think, you know, there are a lot of men in this room and a lot of men I know who are way more compassionate than me. So I think that there is something to be said for not um, dividing, um, you know, the, those two genders and all genders in, in that way. I don't, I don't think it makes sense. I think there, you know, there are lots of ways that women can add more to the food system, but they are already farming, you know, whether they're recognized or not. And they're already in both conventional and more sustainable and regenerative ag systems. So I, I think it's it's a matter of, of um, you know, enforcing the values that we all want and, and not dividing it in terms of, of men and women and, you know, others. So I, I think that's part of the maybe the problem when we're talking about um, women in farming that we're dividing in that way and assuming that they're going to act one way and not realizing that, you know, every person is, is different and how they approach things is different. And if we're interested in building a more sustainable and economic, you know, economically, environmentally, and, and socially just food system, then we sort of need to break down those barriers and, and not divide things that way. Yeah, I, I wholly agree with what you just said, Danny. And um, I think one of the one of the things for us is being able to just just being able to like see what a different kind of leadership looks like. That's sometimes challenging for us, right? That that we we're talking about, for example, replacing who's in the workforce right now, like re replacing women in those same systems. And what we really need to be looking to is that there are whole other systems, alternative economies, alternative ways of um, being in relationship with each other and with land and with sharing and um, taking care, again, take, again, taking care of each other and taking care of communities that are uh, equally valid or if not more what we want to be leaning towards and just being able to see that uh, and recognize that work. Yeah, I completely agree, and it's it is that um, uh, hopefully progress of some of the systems that we're seeing transition to a more collective, collaborative um, um, way that is that is more effective at, at creating the world we want. So um, I, I kind of have that same discomfort when I hear those types of qualities of cooperation and compassion um, related to, to female gender. But, um, but I recognize also that, um, it, for me, it's about, it, it's about uh, I'm trying to find the right word, but it's, it's like we're, the full potential isn't realized because of the suppression of these voices and these styles and these um, experimentations with how to get good stuff done. Um, so it's really for me about an unleashing of that talent and skill and contribution that we need to foster. Fantastic, thank you. Um, is there anything you would like to say before we open up to some audience questions? Would you be open? OK. Yeah, we're ready for questions. <laughs> Is it on? Okay. Yeah, I'm uh, Ridge, and I'd like to speak for the old white men. <laughs> We're an underrepresented category in this uh, group, old white men. There's no grants for us and all that kind of thing. But uh, I also just wanted to share, I read a devastating article this morning about suicide in American white farmers. It's way above veterans, like 20% above the norm. These are the guys, you know, the farmers that everybody is, they're in trouble. They're struggling. And, and one, of the <coughs> one of the exciting things is to see all the youth and energy in this room. And a lot of times, you know, you have to go break the system. In this case, the system is broken. There's a vacuum. It's ready for regeneration to come in. So it's very hopeful in a way, but I, you know, I heard that compassion is really important because these farmers are not gonna, they're struggling, you know, personally, emotionally, 
and they're they're lonely, they're separate, and you know, reach out. stand up. Thank you. Um, the president of Canada uh, recently apologized to the LGBT community about um, a lot of the discrimination that Canada um, had against that community. And I think a big part of healing is often acknowledging that past issues have happened and being comfortable talking about them. Um, I think that was a pretty impressive top-down display of um, understanding. And I would love to know, are there more grassroots, frontline ways that we can acknowledge some of the issues that have happened to so many disenfranchised communities and um, really not wait for just top-down leadership to acknowledge it, but to really acknowledge it as, as um, a very diverse movement? I mean, I think a lot of that's happening here in some of the conversations that I've participated in and heard about. Um, and um, I, again, I just I sound I know I sound like a broken record, but the importance of of it, what I've where I've witnessed change is about establishing those relationships and creating those networks where they're safe. You know, I, I thought about it's. Um, uh, I was I was uh, actually hosting last weekend this this group of women um, who address a range of issues of environmental crises and um, some one of them introduced a technique and maybe some of you know about it and I and because I just learned it I'm not well grounded in it so I hesitate a little bit about um, presenting it but it might be interesting to know if others know or can help us but it's this technique called a red dot moment does anybody has anybody used this technique red dot so the theory is is that we often mostly uh, relate to each other in a um, in like a, a realm of normal like most of our conversations and our interactions are similar and sort of in this normal space. And just outside that is sort of what's available to us, like where a conversation or where a discussion can go. And then outside of that is the extraordinary. And that's where like real change and real magic is catalyzed. And so this technique is a, is a cue um, that you can use that when you want to take a normal conversation into the realm of extraordinary. So, and what the cue does, so we started using it in this group and we were talking a lot about sexual harassment and um, sexual discomfort. And um, the, the immediacy of the conversation going, not comfortably, but into like a, 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 a trajectory level jump into real conversation that like is you know soul moving was pretty incredible and what the tool does because you say the technique is you say this, is gonna, this might be or this is going to be a red dot moment but I want to go here and what it does actually someone I just talked to described it it physically you sort of you, you, you take off your guard, right? You sort, of, you sort of welcome it. And it's just, it's almost just like a little warning that, that this is gonna go somewhere, it might be uncomfortable, but I think we can take it there. So I just thought in light of some of the conversations that's been ha that, I've, that I know have been happening that um, I'd be curious to hear from, from you all if that, um, if, if, if you want to practice that or think about it or, um, you know, I just offer it as something that um, was incredibly helpful with talking about difficult issues of sexual harassment this, this last week and some of the issues that um, the question poser brought up. So we've got a question over here. Can, can I just respond to the question poser real quick? Um, which is just to say, <clears throat> no disrespect to the leadership of Canada, but I'm sure that, that he didn't have that aha moment on his own. That, that probably came from a lot of grassroots pressure and organizing and folks calling on leadership to say something and to do something different. And um, that's, that's the power of us organizing together, right, is, is seeing change start to happen further up the chain. Okay, there's a question over here. 
Hello, my name is William Padilla Brown. Um, I'm really happy to see this event located so close to a city and the diversity of people that are here. Um, oftentimes, I mean, I've been attending events like this for the past five years, and oftentimes they're out in some lodge up in the hills or in the countryside somewhere that's very inaccessible to people that actually live in the cities, and I think that's where most of the difference can be made. Um, and I just that was just a statement that I had. And what my question was really, um, I, I see a lot of people that are uh, uh, working towards um, developing solutions for these kinds of issues. And a lot of times they're working for nonprofits. And a lot of times they're not making anything while they're doing it. They're doing it because they believe in this and they know that it needs to be done. Um, I've been involved in things like that. I actually have run a nonprofit. And I've oftentimes been in situations where I'm completely broke or in around a lot of people that are doing really good work that's completely broke trying to get it done. Um, what are your ideas on ways that we can support each other in getting these kinds of things done? Um, I mean, I hear you. And the, the group that I work with, I'm interviewing them one-on-one -on, -one on sort of what they're feeling. And what, I, what, what comes out is tired warriors. That's what, I, that's what I hear. Like, they're just working and up against... Um, you know, tangible resource um, issues as well as cultural um, barriers, and they're tired and they're wary. And um, I think this idea of explicitly creating networks to offer assistance is really powerful and, like, as explicit as you can be. Like, I need X, Y, and Z. I have X, Y, and Z. And we practice that as a community in this group. And it's like, again, it's, it's very powerful. And if you're in relationships that are trusted and um, you, can, you can help each other, like really help each other, I think it, 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 it's what those, all of us that are, that are trying to make this change need. We need help, um, like explicit help, like sometimes money. Yeah. Yeah, and just to add to that, I think, you know, with, for all of us with our nonprofit organizations or whatever form we're working in, is thinking about how we, how we can shift the cultural practices of where we work to. Um, I think a lot of us, because we care about what we're doing and because we see ourselves up against so much, we do work too much. I think tired warriors is a good term. Um, but f for example, how are we building in breaks into our day? Um, like can I go for a run instead of getting on another conference call and just agree that I'm going to push back that call? Or um, can we create a culture of having potlucks at our workplace and people bringing food for each other and taking care of each other or encouraging each other to take time off? Um, I think the, some of the models that I'm seeing that work really well with organizations is moving towards more of a collective structure where there's shared leadership. Um, uh, cooperative consensus building, uh, and it, it becomes easier then for it not to all be on one person. A person can walk away, and other people have knowledge of what that person was doing. Um, it's something that I'm seeing really uh, powerfully in in movements that I'm part of and direct action work that I'm a part of. That uh, it's too much for any one of us to show up all the time, but by being in strong relationship with each other and in a community of care, that we can step back sometimes and know that other folks will keep the work going, and then we can step back in because we have those trusted relationships. Um, I think there's a lot of really great examples of that out there. One of the coolest things that I've been seeing recently is uh, folks collectively pooling resources for somebody to be able to take a sabbatical or to be able to take a vacation. So uh, I've, I've seen a couple examples of that, of just you know movement warriors who, who need a break and everyone else uh, throwing down for a PayPal or whatever it is so that that person can actually do that um, so that we take care of each other. I, I love all of those ideas, but I, I really think for real change to happen and for nonprofit workers and warriors to be paid well, we need to change the funding and donor communities approach to how they f invest in sustainable agriculture. I mean, there's not a lot of direct um, there's not a lot of general funding. There are often, there's often funding for really direct and specific projects. And what the, the NGO community needs, I, I think, and you feel free to disagree, is more sort of general funding to build, to make mistakes, to have that, 
that freedom to make a mistake because so many small profits, including the one you know that I run, we don't have a lot of room to make mistakes because if we do, we're screwed. Mm -hmm. And so I think the funding and donor communities need to realize that this sort of you know very specific support for very specific projects doesn't help build the movement. It, it creates. Um, burnout, Absolutely. it creates a lot of um, animosity, and so we need you know, that funding and investment to really change. And, and it creates a spirit of competition instead of cooperation between organizations, whereas if we had the time to build relationships with each other, uh, we'd all get a lot further together. Yeah. Hi, um, my name is Teddy Rogers, and I am fairly new to farming. And it's something that I love and that I hope to do for a really long time. And that being said, I think about my body and my physical well-being a lot. And I think here, especially in this talk, um, we talk a lot about equality, which is really important. But the fact is, is that my body is different than a man's body. And I'm wondering what's being done there to kind of address that and to address the fact that you know, maybe I shouldn't be doing certain things or certain things at my physical level. You know, maybe I need to build up in a different way than a man would in order to protect ourselves and make sure that we can farm for a lifetime. Can I turn that back to you for a second to share any lessons that you're learning with the group? Um, well, I think. Stone Barns is, I've been volunteering at Stone Barns, and I think um, they're doing a lot of great things here as far as working um, smarter, not harder, and using tools. And I have gotten a lot of feedback in terms of paying attention to posture and you know, really taking care of um, your body. But I guess what brought on this question was that uh, Lori's question about compassion and about um, women being more compassionate than men naturally and I think everyone's response was quickly to go back to oh no men can be as compassionate as women or men are as compassionate as women and yes I absolutely absolutely believe that men can be as compassionate as women but maybe naturally that isn't the case just the way that naturally I might not be as strong or as like or it might not be as easy for me to get as physically strong for this kind of work as a man that's not saying that I can't but there are different gateways and different like um, tools to get there. So I just think it's important to recognize our differences in addition to our equalities. Uh, and that's, I'm just gonna add one thing that I do, I think this is such a great question in terms of physicality of women farming and I, I, I don't know the work well, but maybe it's through slow tools or farm hack, or maybe it's just women, I'm, I'm getting the nod from someone who's in the know, um, women who are on farms sharing information with each other. This is such an exciting, that to me is like so exciting to think about um, re-engineering tools that were built for men to be built for a broader working, um, you know, a, a, population of farmers, what, how, what, that's like tangible and exciting work, so go for it. But you wanted, Danny, you wanted to say No, I, I, I don't, uh, no, go ahead. No, I wanted you. I'm not sure what you wanted We're me to say, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say, um, I, I think, you know, to, to agree with you that, you know, that there's um, this really exciting movement of, of women who are sharing their networks and are sharing through networks and sharing ideas and, and practices. I think from what I've seen in the developing world, um, women farmers have sort of, you know, re-engineered their own tools to work better for them in terms of, you know, sometimes it's smaller tools, sometimes it's different tools, sometimes it's using a, a different pump. This organization, Prolanova, which is sort of a, a, a coalition of, of different farmers groups, they, they're really good at finding ways for women to share that information among themselves and, and, and to, you know, build different devices that will help them do their jobs better and easier. Um, so th those are exciting things that I think maybe women farmers in the developing world have sort of a leg up on, on you know, many uh, farmers elsewhere in the world. So there are those kinds of exciting things going on. I didn't know what you wanted to add. 
Great. So, I mean, I, there's a lot of, I'm happy to talk offline about this to you and, and connect you to those because I, th I do think some of those tools are really beneficial for women farmers in the United States and, and a lot of women farmers here don't know about it. And I think this is an example, you know, we always hear about how much farmers in the developing world have to learn from farmers in the US. And I kind of think it's bullshit. I think it's the other way around. It's what we have to learn from farmers in other parts of the world. So I think, you know, recognizing that and, and um, you know, sharing those, those, those examples is really important and very exciting. Good morning, my name's Alicia, and my question is tangential to the earlier question brought up that paired compassion towards animals with women. Uh, it also draws on Carol Adams' books, The Sexual Politics of Meat, and I'm wondering how we can collectively move towards dismantling the patriarchy and systems of exploitation and oppression in our treatment towards non-human animals, uh, especially when gender is a role. I just, I'm trying to come up with something that's not so repetitive of what I've <laughs> already talked about, but, um, and I'm not, I don't, uh, the, the, what I witness in, on our farm at Glenwood when uh, women are taking care of our animals is really beautiful. I mean, I witness um, those relationships between, um, with, with, men as well and their and the animals they take care of um, what do I want to say um, I I just think that there was a there was a conversation that we that we had earlier about um, women's role in conventional or commodity agriculture and what would that look like? If, what would, would there be change made if more women were in those areas? And my response to that question is like, I'm just not interested in that kind of agriculture. I think it's abuse of our land. And so um, I do think the, the statistic I shared before about 70% of the environmental NGO community is uh, led by men. It's the sustainable ag movement is actually majority women led. Um, so while women farmers are, the statistic isn't is lower, but the 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 f the folks that are creating space for more sustainable and regenerative practices is women led. So I think there's potential in terms of women stewarding animals, um, not exclusively, but. It was a little bit of rambling, sorry. I, I think that there's, I, I don't know how to say this well, but I think that there's something about um, meat culture and excessive meat culture that is very much tied to the amount of time that we take with our food and our, um, our very superficial relationship to where our, our food comes from. And I... I, I want to find better ways to articulate this, but I, I think that part of what we're dreaming for and aiming for when we're talking about these regenerative systems is um, embracing and valuing the, the labor that it takes to, to nourish each other and nurture each other in ways that are not just about food production, but also about how we prepare food and how we share it with each other um, and how we take the time to eat it with each other. Uh, and when we're doing all of that, it's just not, it's not possible to eat the scale of meat that folks are eating right now, right? And I think for many people, the reason why you go to a meat-based product is because it's like this really dense, really quick way of getting protein and calories. Um, well, whereas if we had s systems that were more regenerative and where we were able to take more time and our cultures looked different in those ways, I think our relationship to meat would look different too. And I don't have a great articulation of this yet. Um, if somebody does, I'd love to talk to you later about it and to think more on that. Question here. Hi, hi everybody, I'm Karen Washington. And I, the question that I'm posing is in terms of financial viability. I'm saying this because it is, is there some way 
that a hedge fund, some sort of investment for the future of farmers. And I say that because most farmers end up broke. I'm trying to work with my farmers in terms of thinking about they need to start investing. I did that at the age of 23. So I've, you know, I have investments and I have um, financial stability, but I'm looking at the young farmers that don't have that. So is there a way that we can develop some sort of hedge fund, some sort of investment tool, so that these farmers have something to look for 20 years down the line and not be broke because they never had time to think about investing? So that's where I'm trying to, to sort of bring that conversation. What do we do about the future of farming? You know, I put my investment in, I'm stable, but what about you that work so hard but never take the, the, the time to think about investing 20 years from now? If you think Social Security is going to pay you away, you can forget it. But if you have not thought about investing at an, at an early age, so what can we do in terms of developing, developing a hedge fund, a pool, so that these farmers have something at the end of their, their lifetime? Yeah, I think that there are some. <laughs> Karen Washington. Um, <laughs> I, th I think that there are some there's some great models, and we need more thinking about like land trusts and how we um, hold land in perpetuity for farming and for sustainable agriculture. A lot of what we're seeing is um, older farmers or farmers who have been trying to work the land for a long time getting foreclosed on, or um, or losing their land, or you know if their kids don't want to go into farming, then uh, that that land is just lost and. Um, there, there are some great models out there of land trusts that exist. I think that that's something that we need to be looking more towards and, and building more of, um, as well as revolving loan funds that can help support folks in agriculture and the idea of somebody with a lot of money um, creating some kind of a hedge fund like that sounds great. Um, the other thing that I'll just give a shout out towards, uh, I don't know how much this has been talked about yet, but the Farm Bill is coming up next year and in the next couple of years. And one of the things that we really hope folks will uh, think about and work on is uh, ensuring that there's greater access and more equal access to credit, technical assistance, loans, um, and that there isn't so much predatory lending as there has been in the past, uh, especially for young farmers and for farmers of color, socially disadvantaged farmers and ranchers to get access to those loans and technical assistance. Um, so get ready to be making your phone calls and writing your letters and doing your Hill visits and going to your local Congress member's office um, when the Farm Bill comes up in early 2018. I would be interested on that question hearing from someone from the National Young Farmers Coalition because I think one of the reasons that young farmers can invest is because they're so saddled with student loan debt. And I think if you know there was forgiveness and, and better opportunities along those lines, we, you know, young farmers and young NGOs <laughs> and advocates could have more money to invest in we as well so that they can keep you know the movement going. So we've been, my name is Joe Cosgrove, Maryland. Uh, I, I work at an outdoor education facility that focuses on environmental science, uh, but we have a food curriculum as well, and that is my domain. So um, I work with, I have access to, we've been talking about very adult issues. Um, I work with about 11 year olds, um, 11 to 12 year olds for the most part, Thir 25 to 30 of them a week for five day residential programming. And I'm just wondering, since you are a concentrated, probably since this is what on your radar all the time, if you've seen any youth, uh, like I have 30 girls at my disposal on a regular basis, and I do my best um, to work on empowerment, to work on self-realization, to work on foundational skills, like self-foundational skills, but I'm just wondering if you've come across any organizations or techniques or things, outreach uh, methods for youth for young women who may or may not go into farming, may or may not go in. There's a lot about farming that was very daunting to me when I was getting started. A lot of machinery, a lot of like kind of walls of mid 60s farmers that I apprenticed under. Um, but then there were a few who were just like, yeah, sure, I'll show you how to do this. So I'm just wondering about the empowerment of our youth because I, I don't mean to scale back down to younger 
minds, but at the same time, that's scaling up because there are a lot of them. <laughs> so I'm wondering if you've seen any techniques. Yeah, I mean, the, the best resource that I've seen for that is the Rooted in Community Toolshed. So if you're not familiar with Rooted in Community, they're an amazing network of uh, organizations that, that are focused on young people's leadership uh, in food systems, food justice, and farming. Um, there are over 100 organizations around the country that do that work. Uh, they come together annually for a, a summer conference um, and share tools with each other, and young people are teaching each other as well as the adults who are part of uh, those organizations get together to train each other up on how to teach these skills better to young people and how to work better with young people. So again, it's called Rooted in Community, and they have something called the RIC Toolshed that has a bunch of curriculum available to folks. Um, I farm in Maine, and in our state we have a number of organizations that I think address some of this, the issues uh, to, that Karen uh, raised about needing investments in farming. Uh, there's a very good farm link program that hooks would-be farmers up with land that somebody wants to have farmed and may even have an option to buy or, or something tied to it. The Slow Money has a good chapter in Maine that tries to get investments for uh, farm projects, and m the Maine Organic Farmers and Gardeners Association, MAFCA, is uh, helping start a credit union now, uh, specifically aimed to make capital in in available to beginning farmers. Cool. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, Barbara. Okay, we have time for two more questions. Hi, I'm Hallie, I'm from Wisconsin. Um, I just wanted, I don't have a question so much as offering an example of a group of women who have come together. Um, in southern, in like south central Wisconsin, there's a group called Soil Sisters, mm -hmm. and there are a grassroots, self-organized group of women who are very politically active. They just sued the state of Wisconsin and won their lawsuit to, um, uh, make it legal for people to bake at home and sell their baked goods. It's like a way for women to, well, mostly women to um, gain some income. But there are also a ton of field days, a lot of sharing of knowledge. I went to a fencing workshop that was all women, which like that can be kind of intimidating for women to like have to bury posts in the ground and figure out how to, you know, get up a woven wire fence. So really cool. Um, skill sharing and also like they're just very social a lot of potlucks and um other events so it's it's not always like so politically i mean it it always is but um there's a lot of lightness too and a lot of just community that's really great so if anybody's interested in starting something like that in their community it's a really great example of women who've come together who are protecting their resources in their communities and just trying to lift each other up so Some great resources, and I don't know how the conference is sharing resources, but um, I'd be happy to add the a number of resources that are dedicated to women in food and ag, but I'll just mention here, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with the Women in Food and Ag Network, um, that actually has a one of their programs that I really admire is getting um, farmers, women farmers, into having them run for office. So it's called Plate From Polite to Politics. Um, so uh, worth checking out if you aspire or desire to become politically active. Got one over here. Hi there, I'm Heather Jarrett from Vermont. Um, one of the biggest, um, I guess, barriers to gender equality is childcare. And I'm wondering if you can speak to how you see that changing in the future. I hope that childcare is a shared experience. That's my desire, that it does, the burden doesn't fall um, if it's a, in partnership on one, on one partner in that situation. So how we move again from sort of these older models of um, patriarchy into a more partnership society is a, a long-term answer. Do we have time for one more? Oh, Two more? I 
Allison Martin of the Livestock Conservancy. We've talked a lot about external forces of change. Uh, my question is, for each of you, what advice do you have for individuals who are disenfranchised to push through the barriers while we're waiting for external change to happen? I mean, I, I think we've heard a lot of it, especially from Navina today. It's building networks. Kathleen talked about building relationships. It's, it's you know, talking to one another, you know, putting yourself in those situations where you're connecting with others who are, you know, experiencing the same thing that you are. I think that's sort of a lot of it, you know, making sure you're making those, those relationships and connections really happen um, and, and getting the resources that you need because they're not always going to be available to you. I mean, I think a lot of this where, you know, it comes because you have to build it, unfortunately. It's not there for you. So I, I think it's, it's that relationship and network building that we've heard so much about. Yeah, I agree completely. I was just reflecting on that kind of wary warrior analogy that I or used before. And um, I just, in my experience, I can't tell you how powerful it is to ask for help explicitly. And in, in, interesting in those interviews that I'm doing and documenting with, um, with women who are working on environmental change issues, um, to get to that, like, I'm tired and uh, I'm, I'm scared and I don't know if I'm going to make a living or if I'm going to have enough money or if I can have a baby and do this. To get to those, that really powerful conversation um, often those folks have to have to deal with shame around that. So they're feeling ashamed that they're tired or um, scared, like they're, they're trying to like fuck it up. And um, so uh, trying to break through that in these communities that you're all part of and get to like, what do you need? And how can I get that for you? Like as specifically as possible, I think can be can be really a really powerful tool while we um, work toward the change we all want to see. Everything that's been said, yes. Um, and I think that you know, for for all of us in the room, um, and anyone who's watching, just thinking about um, what resources we have access to and how we um, how we can support each other is an important thing for all of us, right? So how do we, everything that we've been talking about, about these alternative economies or ways that folks are moving away from dominance and patriarchy um, and, and supporting each other, how do we start to visibilize that, right? How do we shine light on folks who are not seen and another kind of leadership that's not seen? Um, when we're thinking about uh, the systems of uh, privilege that we have or uh, any, opportunity that we have, for example, to write a job description. How are we ensuring that um, this job is like really available and accessible to, to women, people of color, to um, gender queer folks, to people who maybe have not been as successful in our traditional institutions or in our dominant culture? Um, there's so many opportunities all the time, not just for us to be like fighting alone as you know, disenfranchised folks trying to make it through these barriers, but to um, help each other out in that and to actively be working to dismantle those systems all the time, right? So we're not just waiting for that external change to happen, but we're making it all the time um, in, the, in the choices that we make and how we talk to each other and how we show up for each other in everything that we're doing too. So first of all, I really want to thank the audience today for just asking such amazing, uh, insightful, and eloquent questions. Thank you. And to the panelists, thank you for creating this intelligent and safe space for us to talk about these issues. And thank you so much for coming. <laughs>